welcome to this community newspaper Facebook program, Excellence in Education. This is Marta Perez, and our mission is to expose and inspire excellence in education. Follow us on Facebook and send questions via our chat room. Now, please let me introduce a very important person in our community who uses his love of his job in not only excellence in our community, excellence in education, but also teaching through his altruistic examples. He is Ron McGill. He is a very public and world known communications director of Miami-Dade Zoological Park and Zoo. For those of you who have been living under a rock and have not heard of Ron McGill or the zoo in our county, FYI, our zoo is the largest in Florida and the fifth largest in the United States because we are the only subtropical zoo in the United States. We have certain animal species that could not survive at other zoos. Our zoo includes 3,000 animals, 500 species, 130 of which are endangered. And the zoo's mission is share the wonders of wildlife and help conserve it for the generations to come. And a very, very important part of our zoo's great international reputation and accomplishments is Mr. Ron McGill, the communications director, and much, much more. He is a dynamo and a pride in our community, an award-winning photographer, documentary producer, creator of the Ron McGill Conservation Heroes Award, the UF Ron McGill Conservation Scholarship, and on and on and on. But let me stop talking about his many, many accomplishments or we'll never hear from the man himself. So please welcome the inimitable Ron McGill. They broke the mold. Welcome, Ron. Uh, Dr. Perez, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm honored to be here. I really am. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your very interesting background, how you grew up, and how you got to this point in your life. Well, I've been very lucky. You know, I was born and raised in New York City, started in a small apartment, a place called Jackson Heights, uh, moved out into Queens. My father was a Cuban immigrant, came over to this country uh, with only a formal fourth grade education. Having said that, he was the smartest man I've ever known. Uh, my, my mother is the daughter of a Colombian and German immigrant. Um, and, you know, we grew up in, 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 in New York City, but my father always yearned to come down to Miami. He always dreamed was to have a piece of property where he can raise his mangoes and his avocados. He wanted to bring the beauty of where he came from in Santiago de Cuba um, and, 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 and be in the outside. And so he did that. You know, he bought a piece of land. We moved down here in 1972. And um, I've always loved animals animals for me. I tell people now, these kids today, they're so lucky, you know, they have this plethora of television programming. They have Discovery Network, Animal Planet, you know, National Geographic Channel. When I was a kid, there was really only one show growing up. 7.30, Sunday nights, right before the wonderful world of Disney, it was called Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And that show was like a religion to me, Dr. Perez. I'd watch that show and I just became so enthralled with this gentleman named Jim Fowler, who was one of the hosts of the show. And I'd watch him jumping out of helicopters on top of caribou. I'd watch him you know, rappel down a mountain and grab condors with one hand. I saw him throw a net and catch a jaguar in the Amazon. I'm thinking, this is amazing. That's what I want to do, you know? And um, in doing so, I watched that show, never dreaming that one day I would actually meet Jim Fowler about 30 something years ago. How did you meet him? I met him because he was doing a national tour around the country for Wild Kingdom. And he stopped at the Miami Beach Convention Center and he would contact the local zoos in whatever city he was at to bring an animal so that he could talk about the animal. You know, he didn't want to fly with animals around the country. It's too stressful on the animal. H how did you get a job in the zoo? Well, I, that was always my dream. So I started my first job working with animals was at a place called the Miami Serpentarium. Uh, it was an I old remember that. Yes, on, on US one by Sunnyland Park. And that was my first job, just getting experience working with animals. Then I said, okay, at, th at first I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. I said, I want to help animals be a doctor of animals. But then I took my first chemistry class at the University of Florida <laughs> and I said, I got to come up with plan B. <laughs> so I said, you know, I want to be working with wildlife, working conservation. And when I was there, I, I was raised, my house is just literally three or four miles west of where the zoo is now. 
But when I was out there and I was at college, I saw the sign come up for the decade of, uh, of bonds, the decade of progress bonds issue. It right. said, new zoo coming new here. I said, that's it. That's a sign. I've got to work at that zoo. So I sent in an application when I was still at the University of Florida. And in my senior year, they called me. They said, you we'll want. give you a job, but you need to come right now. And you had experience already working at the Serpentarium. At the Serpentarium, and I also raised horses. We had horses on our property side, worked outdoors sure, with horses. So, so I had a lot of livestock experience. Were you at all involved when they changed uh, the zoo? Yes, from I'm, get, I'm getting to that right now. Because oh. when I started working, this zoo wasn't built. I started working at Crandon Park Zoo on and, and for those of us who remember that, those ancient times, yes. what kind of a zoo was that? You know, it was a beautiful park, but not a very good zoo, Dr. Price. We had the old cages with the bars and the concrete floors. As I look back, it makes me nauseous to think that we actually kept animals in those types of environments, you know. Um, it, it was really quite sad. But zoos have come such a long way. And we, which was back then called Miami Metro Zoo, as you remember, that was really the beginning of a new era for zoos. It was the first, one of the first cageless zoos. Yes. Where I we mean, had open moated exhibits. Yes. And I was part of that whole process of moving all the animals from Cranon Park down to the South Day location. I'll never forget, we were moving the giraffe. And the giraffe, we had him on a, a flatbed truck in the back with a crate with an open top. So the giraffe's head is sticking <laughs> out, you see. So we're coming down US 1 with police escorts. Oh my And goodness. as we're coming down, I'm standing in the back by the crate with the giraffe. And on the opposite end, people going north on US 1, all you heard was like, er, boom. Because people were looking at the giraffe and they kept rear-ending people right in front of them. There was like three or four accidents coming down because people couldn't believe the sight of a giraffe coming down US-1. Right. So as part of that whole, it was like a Noah's Ark bringing the animals over to, to Miami Metro Zoo. When we officially opened, the grand opening of Metro Zoo was in December of 1981. We had a, a preview center open in July of 1980, but the official grand opening was December of 1981. So when people complain that the zoo, it's, it's, it's hot in Miami, and, and I have to walk so much. What do you say? Well, first of all, you don't have to walk everywhere. Um, you can do it. There's a couple of great options they have at the zoo. You can rent a safari cycle, which is a cycle, four wheel cycle that you can ride through the zoo. The great thing is the zoo is flat, so riding is, is easy. It's, it's, listen, it's over three miles of walkway if you walk every part of the zoo. Right. The other thing I tell them is go when the zoo first opens in the morning. There's a lot of benefits to that. First of all, it's cooler. But second of all, the animals are much more active at that time. You're going to get much more activity from the animals. If you go to the zoo at noon or one o'clock, you know what? People will come up to me and they'll go, why are they sleeping under the shade? And I want to look at them and go, because they're smarter than you. Okay. <laughs> they, 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 this is what animals do. You know, they're going to relax in the shade. And what do you think of this? Uh, just uh, uh, it was maybe a year ago or two that uh, circuses are no longer able to perform because of the animals. What do you think of that? I was very much in favor of that. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, Dr. Perez. As a little boy, I went to the circus and I was like, wow, mm -hmm. because I didn't know better. And I think now with education, people are understanding that that's not the right way to have certain animals. It's one thing to work domestic animals, dogs and ponies in a type of act, okay, because that's a different situation. But it's not natural to have tigers line up next to each other and jump through flaming hoops. Those animals are going through stress. Same thing with elephants, you see. So having that you know, exterminated basically, having that end, I thought was a wonderful thing. It was a reflection of how education has made people understand what is right and what is wrong for animals. How about magic, uh, animals used in magic? Um, again, if they're domestic animals, domestic doves, domestic like, dogs. Like the, the, in Las Vegas, those acts, et cetera. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of that either. And I did go see Siegfried and Roy when they had that, that, that show. Oh, and it was it was amazing. a spectacular show, but for the same reason, you know, if you want to make something appear disappear, do what you know David Copperfield does. He makes a plane disappear and disappear. You don't have to do it with an elephant. An elephant. You know, so then these are things that are options. And I think now with education, people are understanding that and they're saying, no, th we'd rather see this. That's why Cirque du Soleil became so popular. Because Cirque du Soleil understood that you don't need animals to have an incredible circus. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. But it's all changes and it's all through education. Absolutely by people like you, which we have to be so thankful. Now, tell me why you think, and this is about education, this program, uh, it's so important to teach children about about animals. What, what is the connection that children get if, if they are exposed to animals and 
Go ahead. I think one of the things, first of all, you know, I realize that everybody cannot have a pet dog or a pet cat, but when you can, I think initially that teaches a responsibility and it teaches a compassion that becomes part of the fiber of that child. You know, I know I grew up with dogs and, uh, and, and horses and it just taught me a connection. Um, I think a lot of times that we make a mistake with animals. A lot of people are afraid of animals. And what I try to teach them is that there's no reason to be afraid of an animal if you learn to properly respect the animal. So it's just a matter of observing an animal, learning about that animal, learning its natural behaviors, understanding that wild animals are not pets. You see, people have this Exactly. This conception, they see them holding, you know, uh, a baby tiger or or whatever, some wild animal. And they think, oh, my gosh, I want to have one as a pet. Could, could not be more incorrect in that mentality, because there's an old saying that says you can take an animal out of the wild. You can never take the wild out of the animal. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and that is so important to understand, not, notwithstanding the fact that there are thousands and thousands, if not millions of dogs and cats and shelters around this country looking for a good home that are going to make great pets, that are going to give you that compassion, that love that these wild animals won't. Yes, we spoke about uh, Siegfried and, and Roy, mm -hmm. and as much as they were caring and loving, et cetera, uh, they, we know it led that to his death, actually. The, Eventually, it led, led to his death. A, a, what was it, a tiger that was attacked a tiger, a white him, tiger grabbed Roy, Grabbed yes. him and attacked him and... and uh, he was never the same and no, it led to his, his death. So no matter how, and they were experienced uh, And, and uh, there's animals. no question that they loved their animals. Absolutely. Their animals were well cared for. They loved the animals. It was just the message that they were giving to the public that I thought was dangerous. And I think, what do you think about also some of the cute little cartoons that children see? And then they say, oh, that's a cute little bear. Bears are so dangerous. Yeah, a hug, a huggy bear. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I tend to to differentiate that a little bit. I mean, I, I watched Yogi Bear growing up, and I never thought for a moment that a bear is going to be a friend of mine when I see him in the forest. Uh -huh. You know, I think children have an ability to differentiate between a cartoon fantasy mm -hmm. and watching an actual person holding the actual animal. That's right. I think there's a there's, there's a line. More, yes. Yeah. Now, another among your many many accomplishments, you're an award winning photographer. And you brought some pictures because uh, you couldn't bring the animals themselves right. <laughs> because of the pandemic. So we are going to show some of your favorite pictures sure, sure. and you can tell us about them. Okay, let's see. Well, this is a, you know, oh one of my first trips to the Arctic to see polar bears. Uh, and, you know, one of the greatest experiences in my job, Dr. Perez, has been traveling around the world uh, as much as I, you know, value the importance of formal education in school, I will go as far as to say there are a few educations that are better than travel itself. When you can travel around the world and meet other people and learn about other cultures yeah. and learn about different things. So being able to see these polar bears for the first time in my life in their natural culture, you know, natural, their natural environment, understanding the challenges now of climate change, the challenges they're having, it was pretty great. You That's know? Fa fabulous. Yeah. So next, go to the next <laughs> picture. Now we go to the flip side. Oh my this, gosh. Is like a, this is like a painting. So as uh -huh. a little child, I always dreamed about going to Africa. Uh -huh. And you go to Africa and you think, what is it going to be like? And I remember waking up in the morning. This is as the sun is rising. And that's Mount Kilimanjaro oh in the background. Gosh. That's the tallest standing single mountain in the world. Uh -huh. And you see the little sliver of white on the top? Yes, sir. That ice cap is losing itself oh. more and more every year uh -huh. to the point where they're saying in 15 to 20 years, there won't be an ice cap up there anymore. And, and I know that. I'm, we're talking about animals, but I know that you're a great conservationist and and you uh, advocate for not just looking at the animal, but looking at the, the entire environment. 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 Yes, that's exactly, and that's, that was the purpose of the zoo. You know, when we opened Zoo Miami, that was the thing is to create an exhibit that didn't just exhibit the animal, but it exhibited the environment. Yes. And because if we don't protect the environment, protecting the animal is a moot point. Exactly. Yes, next. All right, this oh. was one of the scariest moments in my life. This was on the Nile River in Africa, and I was basically trying to document hippo behavior, and I'm leaning over a dugout canoe, and all of a sudden this hippo just lunged out of the water and came at me like a killer whale. I mean, thank goodness we had a motor on the back of the boat. I was, whoa, we got a look. But this hippo, hippos are the most dangerous animal That's in Africa. That's what I've heard. More people are killed and injured by hippos than any other animal. And I, I, I took that picture, not consciously, I took that picture because when it jumped out of the water, I must have jerked oh. my finger and hit the shutter by accident oh, and it took wow. that photograph by yeah, accident that's one, one the next picture do. is another instant oh, working with cheetahs in the that wild happened, that was 
He was trying to lunge he at was, you? He was trying to scare me. But see, I understand cheetah behavior. This is not something he's going to come at me. I would never turn my back. As long as I didn't turn my back and held my ground, he basically stomped his feet on the ground and then ran away. But that's understanding the behavior. And oh that's what gosh. I try to tell people. If you see a stray dog in the street or you see, God forbid, you know, a, a, a mountain lion, the mountains on a hike and it's coming towards you or a bear for that matter, never turn your back and run. That is going to instigate the attack. If you keep your, yourself facing, put your arms up and go, hey, like that, uh -huh. the animal's going to stop. It's going to stop. More often than not, it's going to stop. It's going to run away. And that's why I took that photograph when oh, did that. That's great to know. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is an incredible <laughs> oh, photograph because gosh. this was Look our two that. male lions at the zoo when they were fighting over the female. Oh. And people think these two guys were brothers. They grew up loving each other. They were best of friends until we put the females out there. Uh -oh. You know why, Dr. Paris? Why? Because females sometimes make males a little stupid. <laughs> okay. And that's what happened. These guys were fighting, and that's a, just that moment to see the, the the rage in his face and the power. It's just, you know, it's a split second that I love about still photography. Beautiful. Wow. All right, next one we got. Oh, this oh. is our meerkat and their meerkat babies when they were born at the zoo. Oh. That wonderful moment where that meerkat looks like it's smiling at you. It looks like <laughs> such a proud little mom. You know, this is the, the beauty of photography for me is that it's the greatest tool I have in trying to inspire kids to oh, care about goodness. animals. There's an old saying that says, in the end, we protect what we love. We love what we understand and we understand what we are taught. Very and that's good. a big tool for me. All right, our next picture. This is another great moment. This is in Uganda. And oh this is a, an elephant. We're on the we're going down the river in a boat, and this elephant all of a sudden just came in the water and flared its ears out. That's a big threat when African elephants put out their ears like that and they start waving their trunk. But it's such a feeling, you know. I tell people all the time, my favorite saying in the world is that life is not measured by the number of breaths that you take. It's measured by the number of times your breath is taken away. <laughs> and when you have a moment like that and you go, oh, it's a breathtaking moment, man, you just remember it. Okay, I don't know what else we have. Oh, what a moment this was. This was a gorilla uh, right after she was born. And this moment where and his mother is holding it in its lap. And look at the way that, that baby is looking up at its mom. You know, you <laughs> understand animals have the same emotions we have. They do. They have, they have fear. They have happiness. They have, you know, sadness. We need to understand that. There's a term called anthropomorphism, which is basically saying that you're giving human qualities to an animal. But I think we're very selfish as humans to think that we're the only ones that have those emotions. Really? Animals, I believe, have them also. Even cockroaches. Okay, you're drawing a line there. <laughs> I don't like cockroaches. This was a moment in the mountains, mountain gorillas. You know, as a little kid, I watched Dr. Fossey, uh, Diane Fossey in the uh, Virunga volcanoes uh -huh. on a National Geographic special. And I wonder what it would be like to see those mountain gorillas in person. And this was the first time I got to go to, to Rwanda and stand in the same place where she stood. And that's my first mountain gorilla looking through the forest, looking up at the sky. And I'm thinking, my gosh, am I really here to see this animal side by side to photograph this animal? I mean, Dr. Perez, I say it all the time. If I die the minute I walk out of the studio, nobody should shed a tear for me because I have lived this life that I cannot believe. I pinch myself. Every time I look at the photographs, I relive it. That's the great thing about photography. The photographs document something that you actually did and you go, wow. It, it, it's it's amazing. It is. How, how was it for you to go and, and see those? Oh my gosh. There's nothing to explain that feeling. I had one of the gorillas actually come. You're supposed to keep a 15 foot distance between you and the gorilla so that you don't transfer any possible disease to the animal. To them. But if they come to you, you can't turn and run away. You just got to go down in the fetal position and stay still. I had one of the gorillas come right over to me, sat right next to me, and she took her mouth with her lips and with her lips, she tugged on my earlobe. And I just heard her in my ear just go, do you know what a feeling that is oh to have such a goodness. majestic animal right next to you? And she's, this is one of the rarest animals in the world. I'm sitting on a volcano on the side of a volcano with this mountain gorilla next to me, pulling on my earlobe with her lips. It's just one of those things that, again, you never forget those you moments. You are lucky to have had that experience. Oh, it's just Absolutely. beyond lucky. Yes. They're priceless. They're just priceless <laughs> things. Amazing. And, 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 uh, uh, yeah, that, that's right. That it, it, We are a danger to them. Yes, we can Absolutely, be. Absolutely. Yeah. As a matter of fact, now during the pandemic, nobody has been able to visit the gorillas because of that. Oh, in, in, in Africa? Yes. All the gorilla trekking has been canceled. And, and how year. about all of those uh, photo safaris of those? Continued? They are now continuing. They were closed for a long time. Oh, and, 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 and the, the ecotourism you know, economy was dying in East and Southern Africa. But it's starting to come back now. Oh, oh yeah. And what's next? I don't know. Is there another one? Yeah. Oh, yes, there is. There's one more. This was another moment. Oh, my gosh. I watched this leopard. She had killed a little antelope, and I watched her not eat the antelope. I started watching her walk into a place, and I go, she must have cubs. 
So I watched her walk. And then all of a sudden she walked through some thick grass and she walked to the top of this termite mound and she sat on the termite mound by herself without the antelope. I said, she's got to have cubs. She left that, that, that kill down there for her cubs. I waited over an hour, Dr. Perez. And sooner or later, absolutely. All of a sudden I see the grass rustle and her cub came up and came right up and rubbed against her face. I took that image. It's a moment I will remember for the rest of my life. I mean, I was, I had tears in my eyes. I was shaking. I'm surprised the image came out sharp because I was shaking so hard when that cub turned up. And it shows that with <laughs> wildlife photography, you have to have patience. You can't make an animal do anything. You have to wait for things to happen. And that was a prime example of that. <laughs> so which is the most dangerous animal in your opinion? <sighs> The human being is the most dangerous animal, in my opinion. Okay. Um, but as far as wildlife goes, um, you know, it's hard to say. I think, I think elephants are very dangerous because they're very intelligent. They're very smart. They have been abused by humans for so many years. You know, elephants, like the old saying, do have a memory. Uh, and, and families pass down the fact that... Uh, humans have hurt them and they can be dangerous in that sense. Oh, really? But it's not because they're mean. Animals are not mean. There's no such thing as a mean animal. Animals act instinctively to survive and people need to understand that. And I have to ask you this question. As much as you love animals, are you a carnivore? You know what? I'm an omnivore. Uh, I do eat meat. Uh, having said that, I don't eat fast food meat. I don't eat uh, uh, um, meat that's not uh, raised in a, in a humane way. I always look for, you know, free ranging chicken eggs. I, I, I try. I, I believe that you can eat animal protein as long as it's harvested humanely and done properly. It's just part of, I believe that we as humans are omnivores. Now I know there's going to be the, the uh, vegetarians and the animal people are uh, who are, who are going <laughs> to lay into me and say, how could you do that? Um, it's just something that I believe as long as it's done humanely, it's just part of the natural circle of life. Right. And, and, what are some of your challenges at the zoo today, Ron? You know, I think the biggest challenge is getting people to understand that the zoo's purpose is to provide windows into the world that when people come, like, I wouldn't do what I do today if it wasn't as a small child going to the Bronx Zoo in New York. Going to the zoo and seeing an animal face to face, it planted a seed in me that was much stronger than anything I could see by just watching a television show or reading a book. That, that, Personal experience is so important in engaging people to care. The goal is to plant a seed that grows into this tree of passion where you want to protect wildlife. You want to make the right decisions to help the environment. That's why zoos are important, and that's what we got to get people to understand. And that we're not taking animals out of the wild to put them in zoos. I would never support that, ever. Um, the bottom line is these are animals that have been born under human care for, for generations. Yes. And they're ambassadors for those animals in the mm -hmm. wild. So you're saying that, well, the, uh, the, first of all, congratulations, because I hear that you are about to hit a, a new milestone in yes. visitors to the zoo. And perhaps it has to do with a little with the pandemic, but it also oh, has to do with the great experience that people have when they go to the zoo. And you're saying planting the seeds, we plant seeds in children more than we do in right. older adults. And, and for that, to your credit, this being a, a, about education, you have several um, programs w in conjunction with the school district uh, to teach children about, maybe you, you'd like to tell sure. the public no, no. A, we, a little bit about I've been it. very privileged to do uh, what they call conservation conversations with Ron McGill that we've done, uh, uh -huh. and particularly with the ESOL students, Yes. okay, where we go live online uh -huh. and I answer wonderful questions about wildlife. We talk about different topics like, you know, the domino effect, how when you do something here, it affects so many other things, how animals are connected. We talk about, you know, the birds, the bees, and the bats, the great pollinators. People don't think about how these animals directly contribute to our quality of life, whether it be pollinating, you know, the, the foods that we eat, that we need these animals to do that. Without them, we wouldn't have these foods that we need so desperately. So by having these conversations, sometimes being with animals online directly with the ESOL students, um, we again engage them. We get them to care about something. We inspire them to care about them. It is such a privilege to be able to do that, uh, you know, with the fourth largest school system in the country. Um, so I, I'm very privileged, I'm very honored uh, I myself am a graduate of the public school system here in Miami-Dade County. Uh, it has been 
provided me with the greatest foundation I could have ever dreamed of for the career that I have led. Uh, I'm extremely proud of my association with Miami-Dade County Public Schools, and I will do anything I possibly can, whenever I possibly can, to help pass it forward. Right, you will have so many projects. Have you ever thought of writing a book? You know, I've been asked that many times. <laughs> I just don't. I don't have the patience for it. I'm not good at that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a verbal storyteller, but I could never write this stuff down. I'm not never good Never say never. Never well, say never. Okay. Maybe when I'm <laughs> older, I don't know. How, how do you relax? I relax with photography. I relax uh, with my wife watching a really good movie and some popcorn, <laughs> you know, in the house. Um, uh, and I relax with travel. Just traveling is one of the things Because yours is a very intense job. People say, oh, he's great. But it, it, it's very, uh, you have quite a hard job. Uh, you have to be on. Uh, you go to many ceremonies. Your wife is, is uh, so accommodating and, and always uh, uh, attends with you. But it's, uh, it's, it's intense. And some days maybe you would rather, you know, sit at home and like sure, you say. Sure, there's no question where I can just unwind, <laughs> lay down on the couch, listen to good music or watch a good movie. But having said that, Dr. Perez, I must tell you that. I am fortunate in being able to say that I don't think I've ever actually worked a day in my life. I think that I've been incredibly fortunate that I, I get paid to do things that people pay to do. Uh -huh. And um, that is one of the things I never thought I'd be able to say. Well, you are so successful at your job. Everybody knows you, loves you. They, I mean, you're one of the pillars of our community. Why, who instilled that in you? Who is your hero? Why are you so successful at your job? Well, it all started with my parents. My parents gave me a sense of responsibility and moral obligation to give back, to give back to something that I love. Um, and, and then, you know, it was teachers. I had some excellent teachers. And, and I say this at the risk of maybe giving a mixed message, but like my most memorable teachers were the craziest ones. <laughs> the people who just came in with these crazy things and would you look at them and you go, you know, I never want that guy to be my dad. Who, who, what, what was he teaching? Biology. Biology. Oh, this guy was out of his mind. Uh, he since passed away, but he was crazy. Dr. Uh, Bill McCreary, I'll never forget him. He would do all kinds of crazy <laughs> songs and, 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 you know, he'd do things he wouldn't get away with. Today, <laughs> but I remembered them and he engaged me. And, you know, I never made an A in his class. And yet he always came up to me and said, you're brilliant, McGill. You're brilliant. He never said a negative thing about me. I go, if I'm so brilliant, why am I not making an A in your class? <laughs> he goes, don't let, don't ever let grades define who you are. Know that as long as you're working as hard as you can, you're going to be the best that you can be. Don't let grades define who you are. And I never forgot that. Well, I, you, you're just, uh, as I say, you're a great uh, ambassador, not just for the zoo, but for all for Miami-Dade County. You are a pillar. We are so proud of you. Thank you so much for coming. We've run out of time, but no thank you so much. Do you have any parting words you'd like? To I just would like to thank this community, uh -huh. the way they have engaged and, and you know, embraced me. Um, I could never say thank you enough to all the people that have come up and said such nice things. I am profoundly indebted to them forever, and uh, I'm incredibly fortunate to be a part of this wonderful community. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And thank you to our viewers and uh, all the best to everyone who, who is listening to this program, Excellence in Education. Thank you.